I, I'll be honest about this. Uh, two things before we start this, this discussion. One was I had definitely had more people come and speak to me and tell me that they're interested in the session. So there are less number of people here. One, <laughs> two. It could be because of the size of the room. Two. Interestingly, uh, when we when we look at uh, when we're discussing on how to go about the uh, the panel. There are two ways we can do it. Given the number of people in the room, I would rather start with the Q&A than doing a panel discussion because there's so much interest and trust me, each one of us, we had enough and more people come, talk to us, uh, wanting to know what we're going to be discussing. Uh, the format that we're going to follow uh, for the discussion is we're breaking the, the, the topic in three different uh, sections. First section is going to talk about neurosciences. The second section is going to be on leadership. And the third section, we're going to bring it all together, neurosciences of leadership. Yeah? And we're going to give 10 minutes each to, to each section. Before I move from section 1 to section 2, I'm going to summarize the learnings that we have uh, from our, our panels as well. Important point for you to note that we actually have a truly global uh, panel members today. So we have people come as far as from the US, from Bangalore, and from Mumbai. And I represent uh, Delhi. So. Yeah. Section 1 on neurosciences and this question is to you Pallavi. Um, how would you define the importance of neuroscience study for an organization? So um, neuroscience is the study of anatomy and physiology of your brain which tells us a lot of what we need to know about effective leadership. So it tells us that leaders need to be more self-aware in order for them to motivate and engage with their staff. It tells us that certain hardwired habits are difficult to change, but they are important to change in order to success in an organization. And it also tells us that how does the brain works in a certain situation. Now, effective leadership can happen when the people around you and the leader are in sync. How do we do that? by knowing how the brain works and also by learning now how to train your mind to be more focused. If I may and if everybody has settled down, I would like to uh, request you all to do a very small exercise. It's going to take two minutes. So if you can all put your cell phones aside for two minutes for me uh, and just close your eyes and ask yourself, I wonder what my next thought is going to be. Be attentive and see what the next thought comes in. Be like a cat watching a mouse hole. Watch what the next thought going to come out of that mouse hole. Try it now. You can open your eyes now. So for most of you, either no thought came to your mind, and for some of them, if it came, it came after a long time. So we'll come back to that. The mind is a superb instrument if used rightly. If used wrongly, it can be very destructive. To put it more accurately, it is not so much that we use our mind wrongly. We, we usually don't use it at all. It uses us. Most of us are living in this autopilot life generated and controlled by our mind. But the moment you start watching the thinker, which is exactly what we did in this exercise, you gain a higher level perspective and you're conscious and you're aware and you are present. And un until you are in this presence, you can be free of thought which is what some of you have experienced. And how fascinating is that? Just as simple as just being present in the now, you can control your mind. And that's exactly what mindfulness is. It teaches us to gain that control back into our present moment and uh, without any judgments. But why are we talking about mindfulness? And why does, and why does neuroscience points us towards that direction that we need to be in the present moment. If you really think about it, both past and future are not real. They are the mental projections of what has already happened and what can happen. So when we were thinking about that, more than half of the chaos created for us, our organizations, and our team is because of this mental time travel that we are doing because of which we are either fretting about the past or we are worrying about the future. 
And the sad part is that most of the times, we keep playing the same repetitive audio tapes in our mind for days, for weeks, for months, and sometimes even for years. Think about something that made you angry, OK? Um, and it changed when, when that happens. It activates certain neural networks in your brain. And then give me, let's, let's take an example. So you had an argument with your spouse or your supervisor or your best friend. That episode lasted for about 15 to 20 minutes. It's been two weeks. And you have been playing the same episode in your mind over and over again. Why did he say that to me? How can he say that to me? He didn't even know my situation. I should have said that and go on and on and on. How many more hours of suffering, anger, frustration, anxiety did you bring upon yourself? And this is the reason why neuroscience is important. Because it tells you, it brings into light these important things that we just neglect because we are in this autopilot mode. And we don't realize that we need to know how our brain works and then train it to be in this present moment so we can be free of this mental chatter. Thank you, Manindar. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. And uh, Shilpa, my next question is to you. Why are we talking so much about neurosciences now? OK. So uh, number one, I must confess, there was a lot of homework I did before I came for this session, because truly, I didn't know as much. OK. When I started doing the homework is when I started realizing, wow, there's so much more to this than I thought. And I think to your question, uh, I think anything to do with the central nervous system, which comprises the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, has a certain mystery to it. You know, the reason for that being that number one, it's all covered by the bone. Okay, you can actually imagine a heart beating, but can you? If I ask you to imagine the brain, I don't know how many of us can actually think and imagine the brain, right? Uh, and as you explained, Manindar, you know, neurosciences is actually a conglomerate of something like nine or ten disciplines. You know, I mean, it, it's a branch of biology, but then it's like it combines physiology, anatomy, molecular biology, development biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A little trivia that I learned when I was actually studying up on this first to do with the brain. The brain actually weighs two percent of our body. OK? But as an oxygen consumer, it actually takes up 20%, the maximum, OK? That's to start with. Then there are 86 million neurons, 86 million in the brain, believe it or not, and 10,000 different kinds of neuron, 10,000. And mind you, this most complex circuitry known to man, it runs on 25 watt, a mere 25 watt. OK? The second thing that I figured out was around the nerves, the nervous system. Can you believe that the length of the nervous system is 62,000 miles, which is approximately 99,779 kilometers, two and a half the distance of the Earth. That's how long the nerves are in this body. Now, if that is not mysterious, I don't know what else is. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. And Shushmita, moving to you, uh, your views <laughs> your views on uh, whether organizations are moving to a holistic approach of leadership development that is actually beyond competencies now. Because we've heard the two panelists talk about the nervous system, look, there are enough and more key words that have been thrown at us. Yeah. So how does it go beyond the competencies that we've been talking about? Um, so if it's a question of yes and no, definitely yes. Uh, uh, you know, organizations have realized over years that not all their best and the most competent professionals <coughs> have turned out to be the most successful leaders. You know, so definitely there is something beyond competencies that feeds into leadership. And that's where the entire discussion on neuroscience, you know, probably started and, you know, probably is the buzzword today in organizations as well, wherein we talk about how neurosciences actually leads, you know, actually gives us leads into understanding what makes a great leader. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of research and, you know, I think uh, Pallavi and Shilpa shared a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things. But uh, one thing that's important to understand is that the research says that leaders are wired differently. 
so uh, you know you you've heard about the debate leaders are born or made and you know we've, we've kind of grown up with that uh, you know that that sentence uh, well uh, research says leaders are born good news is leaders can also be rewired yeah so you can you know so uh, you know, what's what organizations are really exploring or working on today is how do i rewire my great or the most competent professionals to be the most successful leaders as well and 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 that's where the landscape is changing yeah. thank you and you know j just to kind of sum it up when you look at it many a times mentors uh, your bosses supervisors people at home would also tell you go slow to go fast and there's a reason behind it the reason being what you just heard from the co-panelists talking about neuroscience, how your brain works, how the nervous system works, and why you need to give yourself that time to be able to do better. Summing up this part of the discussion, there is there is a the key words that have been thrown are for a leader to be successful, you need to be self-aware. Everyone is not hardwired. There is a opportunity for us to look at and thank you for saying what you said because we at CCL strongly believe that the debate on leaders are born and leaders are made. We strongly believe that leaders are made and can change uh, behaviors. The other one is mindfulness is a word that you use and that's something that I'll come to very shortly. And also the fact that you know you successful leaders is definitely are the leaders who are beyond the, the normal competencies that we've been looking at because those are the ones that can be measured. Every successful person, most of it, when I was doing my own research, uh, you know, most of the successful people who had all that they needed in life in the end committed suicide. So there was something, and there are enough and more names you can look at. Guru Dat was an example that came as well. He had everything that he needed to be successful, but the end committed suicide. So there is definitely a link, and now, basis research, the advancement of neuroscience, there is linkages that are clearly evident between the management practices we have and how the brain works. So with that, we move to the next section uh, on leadership. Uh, and I'm going to ask this question to you, Shilpa, in terms of what makes a successful leader? What, is an, what are the ingredients of a successful leader? So according to me, great leadership, I'm sorry, I'm going to read out because I've done a lot of homework and language is important. So <laughs> I'm going to read out, okay? Um, great leadership, according to me, starts with self-awareness. If a leader is self-aware, he has, uh, he can consciously influence the situation as well as the, you know, the potential climate around him eventually. But if a leader is not self-aware, it can really lead to undesirable consequences. That's number one. Number two, research has now already started. Trying to link actually uh, self-awareness and how it impacts companies' bottom line. There was a recent research done by Conferry International and uh, 486 publicly traded companies were studied and in the research what came out was that companies with a strong financial performance have have employees with higher self-awareness compared to the poorly performing companies okay research is already being done in this area thirdly and i think this is the most important one 95 percent of us is actually in the unconscious 95 okay uh, it lies in our body, it lies in the energetics, it lies in the aura, a whole lot of other things which are still being studied. There's just 5% which is actually here in the brain, just a mere 5%. So does it become important then for a leader to become more and more aware? There's a very powerful line that uh, I will read to you. It's a quote from Carl Jung, a psychologist, a very you know, popular psychologist who's no more, but the line says that until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. I'm going to repeat that, okay? Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate, okay? So a more self-aware leader, therefore, becoming more and more conscious as much as possible, okay? can therefore influence his future as well as that of the organization and the team around him. Let me share an example, a very simple example of uh, a CEO that I'm currently coaching, a CEO of an 
Indian multinational, wants to grow the organization, he's got audacious goals, wants to take it from X to 3X in three years, okay? Very, very audacious goals. They are already uh, in the US and uh, uh, Asia and they want to grow. But when we started working together, he happened to tell me that, you know what, I've got an issue with some people in my top leadership team. I'm like, okay, what is that about? And what we discovered is he happens to have a belief system, which is that, you know what, when they make a grave mistake, if any of the leaders make a grave mistake, I put them in the box in my head, which is, I don't trust you. People don't change. Imagine now, if this was not made conscious, this CEO goes into a meeting with one of these leaders, what happens there if it's not made conscious to start with, okay? And then what happens down the line? What happens to that leader and his energy and then his dynamic with his team and then business performance? So those are a little bit of my views around why self-awareness is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. And I think um, the next question, Shishmita, for you is going to be around why resilience is considered important for any leader. Why is resilience is considered important for any leader? So we talked a lot about self-awareness, yeah. and many a times when you when you have a challenge at work, they tell you to be you need to be a lot more resilient. Yeah. So your views on why it's considered to be important? Uh, so I think uh, you know the the leading question to it is uh, uh, who is a resilient leader? Yeah, and uh, you know if you look at some broad traits, and if I have to club it and prioritize, uh, then there are three traits that clearly stand out. Uh, the first thing is a resilient leader looks at difficult situations in a different way. Uh, that different way is the way where he thinks of uh, thinks of them as challenges. You know, so this is a challenge that's come to me. I've got to overcome it. I have to emerge as a winner. So that's the first thing. The second thing is. Um, a resilient leader is very, very committed to anything and everything that he cares about. So uh, when he gets up in the morning, he gets up for a purpose, with a purpose, very, very committed to the team that he's responsible towards, uh, the mission that he's wanting to drive, the beliefs that are core to him, and, and that makes him what he is. And the third thing is that he doesn't really fret over what he can't control and is very, very focused on things that he can control. So there are these uncontrollables in our lives. We at times get bogged down by it or let them influence us more than they should actually. Uh, a resilient leader really takes them off his mental thinking dimension and is only focused on what he can control. Now think of a leader who has all these three traits. He is an inspiration to the team. He is the person who instills a lot of trust in the team. He's the person who has got this very, very positive outlook and he drives the team to achieve what they want to achieve, irrespective of whether the situation is good, bad, ugly. Yeah. And that's that's the key, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, I think that's the key why, uh, why resilience is extremely, extremely important in a leader. Thank you. And Pallavi, you talked about uh, mindfulness in the earlier section that we talked about. How do we implement mindfulness in our day-to-day -day lives? Uh, so I'll, I'll answer that question. I just want to take one more minute because I was talking to, uh, listening to Shilpa about the research and everything. And I want to share um, that part a little bit. So a research has been conducted by Dr. Daniel Siegel, which tells you that uh, mindful meditation really helps and enhances uh, your brain by actually changing uh, the actual structure and the neural networks in your brain. The meditation is really like a workout for your brain. Like, you know, we do workout for your, bo for your body and we have to be consistent. The same way, meditation is really a workout for your brain. So in that study, he, um, it has been concluded that by doing mindful meditation, it enhances the nine core functions of your prefrontal cortex area. What is that? That's right behind your um, forehead here and that connects with your limbic brain, your amygdala, and your brainstem together that regulates the emotions and feelings in a person. So the nine core functions that are impacted or enhanced are body regulation, attuned communication, emotional balance, which we call economity, um, and then response flexibility, um, morality, intuition, insight, fear modulation, and empathy. 
So all of them, and there has been research con conducted which has been fascinating, you know, when you look at that research, that how this really enhances the core functions of a person. And let's quickly talk about that one area, like response flexibility, because I feel like as HR practitioners, we use that every single day. So what is that? It is the capacity to pause before an action, and especially in a challenging situation. So, uh, you know, that what happens is uh, when you apply that, so as HR practitioners, we have a lot of issues that happen, like employee relations, you need to terminate an employee, medical issues, compliance issues, and all of them are sensitive areas that can be very sensitive to a person. So you need to be aware of what's going on in his mind, what are the emotions going on in your own self, and watching those emotions, understanding their situation and perspective, and then taking a mindful response rather than that autopilot mode of our reaction of our mind that we do. I'll give you a very short example, just take 30 seconds, and road rage. Very simple example, ha happens to all of us. So after a stressful and rushed morning, you finally have your cup of coffee, you're sitting in your car, driving to work. Somebody comes from the back, honks hard, and just cut you off. Your reaction? All of us have been there, right? Angry, frustrated, banging on the steering, uh, steering wheel, cursing the person, you know, what the hell, man, watch where you're going. Or even saying to the point, just spoil my entire day. What a start of the morning. Now let me give you some more information. Now you find out that the driver was taking his pregnant wife to, del to deliver their baby. How do you feel now? All of a sudden you're concerned. You want the person that, and you're wishing that he made it on time. That's what mindfulness and this higher level perspective gives you. And the more important thing, it gives you the chance to watch your own emotions while, they're, while you're having them that, hey, really getting angry in this situation is not going to change anything. He has already passed me, right? You know, this has already happened. And does give you the capacity to have that um, response flexibility and have a mindful response. And now let's quickly jump to how do we apply this mindful meditation in our day-to-day -day lives? What are the small things that we can do? You know, we don't have the luxury of uh, going to Himalayas, become sadhus and just meditating and yeah, have that peace and serenity. We have our lives, we have our work, we have our kids, we have our family. So what are the things that you can do? Simple things. Uh, you can wake up in the morning, have a 15-minute meditation session right in the morning, and just focus on your energy of the uh, your your own energy, and focus on what are the goals and intentions of my day. What do I want to do today? Just a simple 15-minute uh, meditation. Then you do the same thing: 15-minute meditation, reflection meditation at night. So, how did my day went? What are some of the challenges I had? And just Spending the time with yourself, because we never have enough time to do that. I sometimes actually even do a five-minute meditation session right before my an, an important meeting, or sometimes right before my lunch, just to have and know the feelings what are going on in myself. And then once you start doing these sitting proper meditation sessions for a few weeks, it will train your mind, like we talked about with this research, that it will train your mind to focus more in the present moment. And then you can start applying mindfulness to pretty much anything you do. Any small exercise, um, you know, assignments or things that you do during your day that can turn into mindfulness exercise. Example, a mindful shower. Rather than standing in the shower and thinking 100 things that we all do, rather than that, just closing your eyes, really feeling the water, experiencing and feeling that shower. Washing the dirty dishes, you know, feeling the water on your hands, scent, you know, getting the scent of the soap, the noise of the water, feeling, just being in that present moment rather than again thinking, oh, now after this I need to do the laundry or, you know, whatever that goes on in our mind. So any small activity can turn into a mindfulness exercise. So if somebody tells you, hey, I don't have 15 minutes to meditate, don't meditate. That's just giving you a chance to train and, you know, uh, train your mind to have that sitting practice so you can a little bit get more used to how do I bring myself because there's so much mental chatter going on in our mind, we just don't know how to stop it. And meditation is not about stopping it. The thoughts are still going to come, they're still going to flow, but it gives you a chance to just watch them and, and just don't get affected by them. 
So those are some of the small things that you can do and apply on your day-to-day -day lives. Thank, thank you, Pallavi. And when you, while you were speaking, there were enough and more thoughts that are coming to my mind because most of us have received these advices from our bosses and saying, you know, don't respond to an email, any jerk reaction, sleep over it. And now you know when you look at neuroscience why they were saying it because we talked about things. But again, key takeaways from this particular section, train your brain is what I noted. Right? And what you said very, very ap appropriately, we all can do that. We could train our brains. Self-awareness, very important for a leader to be self-aware. What are the triggers? What makes you happy? What doesn't make you so happy? Uh, here, I would like to quote a CCL research. Uh, and we have four fundamental competencies that any leader across any leader level needs to demonstrate. Uh, Self-awareness, learning agility, influence and communication. Any um, responses from the audience to say why these four? It's a very simple answer. Why these four? I'll repeat it. Self-awareness, learning agility, influence and communication. Why are they considered to be the fundamental four competencies any leader level needs to display? Yes, Rahul. Yeah, I'm just going to hazard a couple of things. One, uh, environment is very dynamic. Right. And the second thing is you work so much more in matrix organizations, so influence becomes yeah. So I, I'll give you the answer for this because these are the only four competencies you cannot delegate to someone. <laughs> okay. So that, that that's the fundamental four that we have here. The second is, uh, you know, when you look at leadership, it's all about being committed to a purpose. So you talked about getting up in the morning. What, what do you get up for? What do you do? You have a purpose. And if you have a purpose, you have a team that can actually do what you want them to do. The other piece is, if you look at, if you do uh, Google on leadership, you'll find enough and more definition. For us in CCL, the leadership is all about D, A, and C, which is DAC, and that's a framework that we have. It's about direction, alignment, and commitment. So you look at any leader, if he has direction, alignment, commitment, he has a team that will make things work. If one of them is missing, you are missing leadership. Right? With that, we move on to the most interesting part of the session now, which is neuroscience of leadership. And I'm going to address my first question to you, Shushmita. It's about deeply embedded leadership patterns and immunity to change. How can neuroscience help? So when we say deeply embedded leadership patterns, uh, nah. What do, we, what do we really mean by them? Uh, patterns or any, any form of patterns, be it leadership or anything else, is basically our experiences. You know, so we have, uh, you know, we were born someday. And uh, since then, we've, we've had experiences that, that have made us what we are. And uh, all our behavioral patterns, including leadership patterns, are basically a culmination of all our experiences. Uh, now, when we talk about changing the patterns we're talking about changing experiences is that possible no right uh, so so that's where this this concept of rewiring that that's that's their that's their neuroscience uh, plays a critical role um, so uh, you know it's uh, it's a very tricky thing but uh, you know but when you look into self awareness mindfulness and experiences and rewiring as three blocks so uh, you know there is there is a way to make this happen uh, okay so let me give you an example so suppose uh, there's this leader uh, who has a certain bias yeah uh, and you as the coach to the leader would uh, get into a conversation to understand where that bias is stemming from one way to do it is, you know, you ask some direct questions. Second way to do it is, you know, you back it up with some psychometrics and things like that. Uh, while you do all of that, you also look, look into experiences that he's, uh, you know, that he shared with you and experiences that he's not shared with you. When I say not shared with you, you know, you may want to uh, have a conversation with key stakeholders in his life, right, from his parents to best friends to, uh, to people who've, you know, who've mentored him through the years. Uh, you need to identify and pick those people who probably know about his experiences more than he does. Yeah. And then when you have a fair understanding of the experiences, uh, that's where you know what you need to rewire, you know, because not everything needs to be rewired. You'll then understand that probably out of those 5,000 things, there are only these three things that need to be rewired. Now, 
again there is a way neuroscience does it there's something called cognitive behavioral uh, you know theory of that addresses it which is about plasticity of brain and all of that but uh, no, even if you don't want to go that deep simple you know that that m using mindfulness as a simple tool this can be addressed so you talk about specifically those experiences which are related to those three things that you want to change you talk about how the first if, if the experiences were different how could they have impacted the person differently and what would have changed yeah you talk about similar experiences which people who are close to this person you know who've experienced this differently and then what kind of people are they and is he okay with them or not okay with them in some cases he would be okay in some cases he would not be okay so you need to get into, to, into these very very active dialogues you may not be able to refilm his life but you may have some trailers you know which would be probably equally impactful and 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 that's that's going to change the world you know, so that's 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 the power of neuroscience thank you and Pallavi, you talked about uh, hardwiring and habits and so the question to you is can you elaborate on the aspects of neuroscience where certain hardwired habits that one needs to be aware of because uh, Shushmita just alluded to certain habits that are there of a leader that you know that you can change, you can work with. What are your views on this particular topic? So I think I'll pick up from where Sushmita said like you know uh, for um, when so success is impossible in an organization without changing the day-to-day -day behaviors of people throughout the company. But it starts with you as the leader. But like Sushmita said, I mean, these are some hardwired uh, changes that you're expecting. So it's hard to change those kind of things. But generally speaking, if you remember this one thing that I'm going to share with you, that's going to help you and your organization if you can share with them how you can um, accept change and what is the real re so I'm gonna discuss or even share with you the impermanent nature of things that mindfulness and meditation teaches us so if you meditate on the breathing breathing in breathing out if you meditate on the flow of blood in your body that is something a reminder that tells you that nothing in this life is permanent or static we are constantly breathing even while I'm talking I'm breathing the blood in our body is constantly flowing it never stops the planets they're constantly rotating constantly revolving constantly moving the entire galaxies are constantly moving and drifting apart seasons weather you take everything anything and this impermanent nature of things is what defines life so nothing, every single moment, whether it's positive or it's negative, it is going to change. Then why do we resist it so much? Why can't we just remember that it too shall pass? If it's positive, rejoice, enjoy. If it's negative, have the faith that it is not permanent. It's going to change. And that's why, you know, when you're doing these mindfulness exercises that gives you this general sense of, why are we resisting change? Because resisting change is like resisting life. So just enjoy every moment, make the best out of it, and remember that life is change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Shilpa, now uh, my last question for the section is, how neuroscience techniques can be applied to leadership development? OK. So what are we in business for? Results, right? <laughs> I mean, we're all here in business for results. How do you get results? How do you get results? Action. We do something, right? And let's say the results are not happening. What do you do? Change, Change the action. But we keep doing action. Action after action after action after action. We keep doing that, right? It can be pretty exhausting and tiring. <laughs> pretty. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to uh, quote a very nice line uh, by Albert Einstein. He says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Okay. So what I'm going to bring in here is, so there's results. Before results is action. What I'm going to bring in is something called the observer. Okay. 
what is the observer? This is the OAR model of leadership. Okay, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, right? Um, the observer is actually the being who sits inside all of us, okay, and interprets the world. Okay, all of us have this. And where does this interpretive system come from? Any guesses? Where do you think the interpretive system comes from? Sorry? In life, how does this evolve? How does the interpretive system evolve? Absolutely, absolutely. It's experiences, it's influences, it's parents, it's teachers, it's peers, it's most important people in our lives, right? Because of that, there's this interpretive system. I'm calling this the observer who sits in us, looks at the world with a particular lens. How do you think this observer shows up in the world? It shows up in the world in three ways, body, emotion, and language, okay? Now, what, what is body? Body is just not body language, okay? Body is my stance. Body is my energy. Body is how do I walk, okay? Are my shoulders contracted? Are my shoulders open, okay? Uh, how, is my neck down like this or no? Believe it or not, when you do this, Okay, what happens is you're actually releasing, how many of you are crossing your hands and sitting right now? You're actually re re releasing cortisol, okay, which is the stress chemical in the body, by the way, okay, <laughs> FYI, <laughs> okay, and uh, so that's the body, right? The second is emotions. What is emotion? Emotion is actually energy in motion, okay? So there's a trigger that happens external or internal sometimes we cause our internal dramas also in fact most of the time we do okay and uh, there is some sensation in this body as a result of that trigger okay that sensation in the body is actually the name that we've given for feelings so there is no good and bad it's just a sensation emotion the third is the language okay the language that we talk and not so much on the outside it is more so in the inside that internal talk goes on like how often that voice in the head go on and on and on 90 percent again <laughs> okay so it's about number one can we start looking at this observer with which lens am i looking at the world okay secondly all these three the body emotion and language are a dynamic interplay between each other let's say let me take the same example of this ceo who I was working with and how we're kind of working with him. The, the work is still not finished, but I'll give you a little example. Now, this guy, uh, issue is uh, I don't trust people who make grave mistakes. Well, mistakes will happen, right? I mean, even in top leadership, are you telling me work happens without mistakes? No, right? They'll happen. So the belief system in his head currently is people don't change. I will give no leeway. Simple. Now, there are two ways that we're starting to work on this. And this is where neuroscience comes in. And the BEL model comes in, body, emotion, language, is number one, be aware also. With what lens are you looking at? Okay. Secondly, we're doing something short term. So the short term thing, besides him going in for conversations with these leaders, <laughs> before a conversation, I've told him, hey, listen, you know what, number one, please by the way, anger and judgment, whenever we are in judgment of ourselves and others, it sits here in your jaw, okay? When you want to loosen this judgment, there's an exercise for it like that. Of course, there are loads of other techniques like this in the body, but I've told him, do this. Before you go in, would you please do this in order to release the judgment here? Secondly, please sit in the meeting, do not cross your hands, okay? You're releasing cortisol continuously. And uh, that's, those are the short term things that we are doing. Secondly, in the meeting, be aware. Awareness of emotion allows you to step away from it, right? So that's what he does in meetings. He kind of is aware when irritation is arising, anger is arising in the meeting, he's aware of this. The, so basically this short term stuff we are doing, long term, we are kind of working on his story. So his story is basically he was a kid very lonely at home, okay? 
and twice in his life once as a kid between 5 and 10 and once when he was in college what happened is he was ostracized from the group he was made a pariah thrown out of the group number one you're a lonely child number two you find friends and then people throw you out of the group you can imagine the amount of pain that's caused so what's come into his head is you know what when when a mistake is made you know i'm not going to allow leeway once enough no more leeway now we're working on this right exactly so we are working on this with him so one is the short term one is the long term we are trying to change the observer that he is somewhere the questions that I think I'm asking him is is this belief true actually that you know people never change is this true about you to start with have you not changed over the years the second question just an example let's say you hold on to this what are the consequences of this right so once we start working on his emotions, once he start, he also starts having a very different body when he goes into meetings, there is an interplay. Language also, we're working on language. We've made him aware that, hey, pal, you're holding this belief. People don't change or I'm not going to give leeway. Something starts shifting at a very radical level. So my, my view is that, you know, as leaders, we can have incremental changes if we keep doing action. We can. Yes, you'll grow five, that 2%, 5%, you'll grow every quarter. But you know what? Real monumental shift, catapult in business, shift needs to start here. Because you know what's going to happen then? What's going to happen is you're actually going to start looking at, you'll have more choices. When you're, when you're not aware, you don't have choices. You're just on auto mode. You're going to have more choices and that opens up more possibilities. So that's my view around this. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa. And you know, just to sum it up, I it, think there's been enough and more in terms of correlations that we build, uh, neuroscience, leadership, how there, and there is evidence now. So if you look at neuroscience as a subject, the research is probably just two decades old. And there are other disciplines as well that are evolving. So neuro leadership, neuro education, neuro law, there's enough and more that's happening in this space. And there are evidence, like, and you know, you should probably rightly mention, there are enough and more evidences that are now there with the management practices that we have and how it affects your performance at work. So again, key work, summing up the, the session, this is, uh, it's about what lens you're using. It's about self-awareness. There is body, emotion, and language that you need to be aware of. There is rewiring that can take place. Uh, mind mapping is possible as a technique to understand what's going on in your mind and as a leader because most of the successful leaders are not successful. Right? So that, that's the summary. But before we go to the Q&A section, what is the one word, and I would request all of my panelists to say, one word that comes to your mind when you look at neuroscience of leadership. We'll start with you, Shilpa, since you have the mic in the hand. Mystery. <laughs> Mystery. Mystery, okay. Pallavi? Um, I'll say being. Being, okay. Shushweta? Enticing. Enticing, okay. With that, I'd like to open the, the house for any questions. Please tell us your name and which organization you come from and address it to the, the panelists that you want to ask the question for, please. Can I have a mic here, please? I honestly did not figure the parameters out. So I'm not going to lie to you that I know more than this. I do know a survey was done. And what I know is what I shared. Okay. So currently, we are struggling to understand what kind of uh, yeah. assessments yeah. are aware, uh, okay. like the self awareness. So that was a curiosity question. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my 40 years work gives me certain insight. I was trying to correlate when you say these things. It's easy to say when you tell about the road rage. But when in pressing situations we work, I don't have those access to the inputs, which like that gentleman is carrying his wife for the year. And I have to respond at that point. Absolutely. Do you have any further insight to this aspect? I do. So, you know, when we say about response flexibility or anything like that, I'll be very honest with you. 
when you practice, for example, in this context, when you're practicing meditation or mindfulness, it's not going to make you this very serene and calm person who is never going to get angry or upset about anything or get frustrated. But the amount of times that you get angry or the duration of time for what length you get angry, that reduces. So rather than getting angry for some, uh, on somebody for two weeks, you may be able to give it up. You will still get angry. We are all human beings. We are not robots. We have this hum emotions and everything. And that makes us human. But you need to realize that when you do practice these things, it brings that emotional stability at some point. So after a day, you may be able to forgive and move on rather than holding on to it for a week. So, so it just reduces the duration and as you practice more and more, you just keep getting better. And sir, if I were to answer that question, it's, it's more around the fact that, you know, the example that she gave of a road rage and, and not knowing, it's looking at the other perspective as well and not restricting it. And again, going back to the word that we've all been using, self-awareness, is becoming the key there as well. Yes, Mamta. I'm Mamta from FIS. Hi, Shilpa, my questions for you. It is very nice and interesting. Um, some habits get formed, as we know, in the first seven years, and they're very deeply ingrained. Do you think when you coach someone, and the example that you've shared, it's also important to link it with continuous counseling? Would that help? Because these patterns are very difficult to change, and they come back, and you would go away, and that guy is still on his own. And he can't keep being his observer under stress constantly. It's sometimes difficult. So, by the way, I'm also a therapist, okay? <laughs> I'm a coach as well as a therapist. So, uh, so a lot of the work, Mamta, for example, that I would do with this guy would not be a one-off session, right? It would be at least eight to ten sessions over a period of six to eight months, okay? And there would be certain practices that I would teach are you all willing to try a two-minute small little thing quickly right now, neuroscience-based? Yeah? Okay. Now, just just follow me to the T, otherwise it's not going to work. <laughs> okay? Uh, just do me a favor. Just hunch a little. Hunch your body a little. Cross your hands. If you feel like you can even cross your hands and legs both. Cross your hands. Okay? Now think think, don't smile, get irritated. Right now, I want you to be irritated, pissed off. Why are these panelists just going on and on and on? Okay. Now, think of an incident, something recent that happened in your life, okay, uh, that really angered you and irritated you. On a scale of 0 to 10, think of something at a scale of 5. Please don't go some crazy relationship fight of 10. 5. Remain at 5, guys. Now, think, what happened with this person? What irritated you? Okay, get more and more irritated, feel it in your body. Okay, are you sufficiently irritated and anxious and frustrated? Or you need more? <laughs> I just got over with it. <laughs> okay, get up. Get up, I'm going to help you get over it. In a minute. Okay, get up. Okay, get up, uncross your hands, uncross your legs, completely sit straight. Just sit up straight, uncross. Okay, now breathe in from the back of your spine. Breathe down from the front chest down to your belly button. Think of someone or something that you love or makes you smile. A lovely vacation, somebody you love, a child, a pet, it could be anything. Okay. Again, breathe up from the back of your spine. Breathe down from the front of your chest down to your belly button. Think of something or someone that makes you smile. Uncross your hands and legs, please. Now think of the same incident again. Think of the same incident. Now tell me what happened. Hmm? It doesn't matter. So you know what? It's that easy. Can you believe it? It is this easy. It doesn't matter. What happened? There was a certain distance. Yeah? That's neuroscience for you. We came out of the autopilot. Yeah? <laughs> you, you, basically what we did in the body is, we number one, there was a lovely energy flow. Your body was signaling, brain was signaling to each part of your body. If you slouch like this, it won't signal. The signal will not go. Brain to here. This perfect signal happening. 
then you released oxytocin you thought of something and someone that makes you smile okay you took deep breaths which is also for relaxation so sir it's as simple as that <laughs> as simple as that oh, thank you